and welcome to COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. I'm your moderator, Faith Rogers with DAB Med. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you'll notice several windows on the console. We do encourage you to move these to your liking and minimize what you don't need. There's a group chat available to communicate with other viewers if you're interested. And you're also able to submit questions for the faculty by clicking the Q&A button to the left side of the slide window. Questions will be addressed during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Um, at the end of the conclusion of the presentation, you will be able to access the evaluation and a test for credit by clicking the claim credit button. Your thoughts and comments are important and will help us develop CME activities on this and similar topics in the future. Uh, we'd also like to welcome our Facebook viewers today. My colleague Matt will be moderating the Facebook chat, so please ask your questions there and he will direct those to faculty. Um, he'll also be posting the link to claim credit. We are pleased to welcome our expert faculty members today, Dr. Stella Safo. Um, she's an assistant professor at Mount Sinai Health System and the founder and executive director for Just Equity for Health. Um, with us today, we also have uh, Dr. Dinora Chinchia, um, Health Sciences Assistant Clinical Professor at UC Irvine Department of Pulmonary Critical Care. Dr. Safo, Dr. Chinchia, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks yeah, thank you. Us. Thank you for having us. I'm super excited about this talk today. So, thank you so much. These are the faculty's disclosures. This educational activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members and faculty presenters. So our learning objectives today are to describe current management strategies and identify potential treatments for mild to moderate COVID-19, evaluate best practices for managing patients with COVID-19 using monoclonal antibodies and other agents, um, and describe the current management strategies and identify potential treatments for COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. <clears throat> Finally, we will be assessing the impact of COVID-19 on Black, Latinx, and American, Indian, and Alaska Native communities and the factors contributing to health disparities in these communities. Um, keep in mind this education is current as of today, this July 16th of 2021. Um, please do refer to the NIH and IDSA for uh, more contemporary guidance if you are watching this enduring. I am going to hand this over to Dr. Safo. Dr. Safo, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me and thank you to all the participants for joining um, on this important topic that continues to remain pretty important um, even as we're all hoping that we can start to wind it down. We wanted to start off with um, I as an HIV primary care provider that work primarily in the outpatient setting. We'll be talking to you about outpatient treatment for COVID by talking about the clinical course of um, infection once you've uh, been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And as we know that the um, illness severity really does kind of go break into chunks that I like to think about as like the 80-20. So 81% of individuals who are infected with COVID will have mild to moderate symptoms. Some may not even know that they have any symptoms at all. Those who do have symptoms may feel like they have a flu-like syndrome or symptoms that feel more like pneumonia. 14% um, of individuals will have a more severe course this could include dyspnea, hypoxia, and you can see uh, some of the involvement, um, lung involvement on CT imaging. Those are the individuals that may tend to be hospitalized. And then there's about 5% of the population that'll have a critical clinical course with COVID. They may have respiratory failure, shock, or multi-organ uh, dysfunction. And it's really because of this, you know, 14% and then the 5% that um, we continue to recommend vaccination and prevention because once um, patients reach that severe and critical stage, uh, the clinical course is really, is really more um, difficult to manage at that point. And so what happens in terms of the timing? And as many of us remember when COVID uh, first came on the scene in March in the US, we were all really focused on the days, what number of days you know, were you exposed? And we now have an understanding um, from the wild type virus of, of what we expect to see over the course um, of about two to three weeks if you've been infected with COVID. And um, about four days before you've been exposed, um, you may not have any, you won't have any symptoms at all. And on day zero, you may start to have very, very, if you are one of the 80% uh, that'll have some symptoms, very mild symptoms like fever, cough, myalgia, dyspnea, 
About day six to 10, you may progress to more severe symptoms. And then there are those who around day 10 uh, prevere to, excuse me, um, uh, progress to even more severe symptoms like ARDS. Uh, we tend to see the course of, of recovery if you're going to recover after about two weeks. It's important to note on this, however, that the new variants of COVID have changed these timelines somewhat and that the infectivity, the time of infectivity um, really can be much more prolonged and the time to progress to severe illness has also um, been seen to be impacted by some of these new variants. Um, and we, myself and Dr. Chichia, will also be speaking about this, but the timing to use certain treatments um, during the course of, of the clinical um, progression of COVID is important to note. And so in the early days, um, if you look at the second uh, box below this, uh, in the early days is when you'll start to see antivirals and antibodies being effective. Once a patient is more ill, that's when you have to start talking about immuno immunomodulators within the clinical setting. And so with this high level overview, we want to kind of talk about, you know, who are we concerned with when it comes to severe illness? And so there are certain risk factors um, that we have seen to portend um, a possibility of having more severe illness. And meta-analyses and systemic reviews have shown us that those with some of these illnesses to the left, including cancer, um, COPD, uh, CKD, and those who have um, some high risk factors like smoking, obesity, and diabetes, uh, may be individuals who you may see experience severe COVID if they are infected. Um, we also have some uh, data that shows us that there are certain high risk groups uh, that tend to, with infection, be at, at higher risk for complications. And this is really helpful. You'll hear us talk about, when we talk about the monoclonal antibody treatments, um, that one of the reasons that we care so much about who could be at risk is because it decides who ends up getting treatments or not. And so case control and cohort studies have shown us that um, individuals with HIV, individuals who have certain other lung diseases, um, folks with chronic illnesses like sickle cell, um, and folks who have received um, stem cell transplantation may also be at higher risk. And then we have um, some mixed evidence around those with asthma, hypertension, and liver disease. Hypertension is an interesting one because it is often listed. And part of the reason why we tend to see it rise up is because those who are hypertensive have metabolic syndromes, carry some of these other conditions you saw in the left-hand column like diabetes. And we know that COVID doesn't impact all uh, racial and ethnic groups equally. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a table that takes a look across different racial and ethnic groups at um, the level of infection, the rates of infection, rates of hospitalizations, and rates of um, mortality among these different groups. And I want you to take a look in particular at the um, rates of death compared to the baseline group of uh, whites as a reference group. And you can see that American Indian um, and indigenous populations have about a 2.4 times higher risk of mortality from COVID. Black and African Americans, 1.9%, and Hispanic and Latinos have about 2.3 times, excuse me, not percent, 2.3 times the risk. So the risk has been shown in multiple contexts to be higher for mortality. And we saw this play out. Um, an early study uh, with about 280,000 patients across 13 states in December 2020 took a look at who was coming in. And they saw that racial and ethnic groups who came in for COVID um, were also those groups that we've talked about have had historic systemic inequities, interpersonal and systemic inequities in this country. And the way that those have played out are what we tend to talk about, about the social determinants of health. Um, and those are things like having limited access to health care, lower general health status, or having more chronic conditions that put you at a higher risk for severe disease, and also being higher in those who do essential work where they cannot stay home and you know self-isolate and quarantine. They have to be out delivering food or working in grocery stores or anything else like that. And so when you take a look to the right where we see that graphic, it isn't surprising that we see that the Hispanic population, um, indigenous populations and black populations had a higher um, relative risk of ED visits compared to the reference groups of whites. And so how are we treating? or how did we treat um, COVID patients in the ambulatory setting? So early in the pandemic, um, and I was, I was on call in, in when we shut down our clinic, we had um, televisits, and then when we went back into the clinic, we did a lot of fielding calls from individuals who had more 
mild symptoms. And we did a lot of advising about how to quarantine and how to isolate. Um, and so what we really advised was around understanding, again, the days that you were at in terms of your infection and the number of days that you were kind of expected to isolate and quarantine. For those who had COVID, they um, were told that they could, they needed to isolate for at least 10 days from the symptom onset. And that in addition, they had to have about 24 hours with no fevers without using um, medications that reduce your fevers like Tylenol. And if you reach that, you could come out of quarantine and start engaging again. For those who had cl close contacts early on, we were just saying go up to 14 days just to make sure that you're not infected and spreading it. And now um, with testing um, after seven days with a negative test, you can come out of quarantine. Um, and so that recommendation was really kind of all we had until we started developing the antibody-based therapies. And as uh, many of you have likely heard, there are many of them. They have gotten EUA approval. Some of them have gotten and then been revoked uh, for different reasons, but there's a tremendous number of work happening to be able to understand how best to use these. So the first um, cocktail that we'll talk about is the Bemlinivimab and Edizevimab monoclonal antibody cocktail. This is from the Blaze One randomized control trial that's a phase three trial. And all of these trials that I'll be talking to you about are looking at mild to moderate COVID. Again, um, from that graphic that I showed you, these um, antibodies are most effective early on in the disease course. And so the dose of 700 milligrams um, of these, uh, 700, 700 milligrams of Benalivimab and 1400 milligrams of Edizevimab, which is given as an IV dose, um, has been seen early on to lead to some reduction in hospitalization and death. However, those data have not been published. We included this in here because Bemlin in the lab is one that has been talked about quite a bit. It initially got EUA approval. However, with the new uh, variants that are out there, we were seeing that the efficacy had decreased significantly, so it was pulled. So in combination now with other cocktails, there's a lot of excitement to understand what its efficacy will be. The next cocktail um, that has been talked about is Casarivimab and Indemvimab, which is a combination um, cocktail that came out fairly early on. Um, phase three study of about 4,000 individuals, high-risk individuals, again, individuals who had propensity to get severe COVID if the disease was allowed to progress. This population included 35% um, Hispanic and 5% Black. And what was noted uh, or what was observed was that individuals who got um, either the low dose or the high dose all had a reduction in terms of hospitalization and death. And so, and this was significantly, uh, statistically significant. The EUA approval was made for the lower dose, the 1200 milligram dose. And the benefit there is that that could be administered sub-Q. Um, again, uh, one of the most important things about these cocktails is that the sooner you get it, the more um, efficacious it is. And so what ended up having to happen was, uh, or what ended up kind of, um, playing out, I think, as these were developed, was thinking about different formulations that can get around the usual sometimes 20 to one hour administration time that is required. And as you know, infusion centers have been fairly busy with everything that's happening around COVID. And so the lower dose was approved um, and that can be given um, sub-Q. However, the IV is, is still preferred because it's what was studied. Um, and the latest um, antibody on the market is citrovimab. That got EUA approval in May of this year from an interim result of the phase three trial. Um, and that trial looked at 583 high-risk individuals with risk factors like obesity um, and other chronic diseases. Uh, the population makeup was 63% Hispanic and 7% Black. And um, it seems like the mechanism of action for this is that it blocks the uh, viral attachment to the ACE1 um, receptor and by doing so decreases the amount of virus load um, in the nasopharynx, which has an impact down uh, the line clinically. Because of its efficacy, it was seen to have an 85% risk reduction for hospitalization and progression to death. Um, it has been approved, and there are studies now that are looking at it in combination with other monoclonal antibodies. So it's worth mentioning at this point that, um, you know, I always say COVID won't let us, you know, live our best lives. Um, and unfortunately, what is happening is every time we develop um, therapies, the new variants that are popping up do require us to think about how, um, you know, how effective these therapies are. And so if you look at the last two lines here, the last two interventions that I mentioned are still, um, they seem to be holding up against the variants. 
Um, and there's a lot of study happening around particularly the new variant, the Delta variant. Unfortunately, bemlanivimab was shown to not be effective um, against many of the early variants that came out. And bemlanivimab and um, edizavimab may be effective in some areas, but if there's more than 10% of certain variants uh, present, such as the beta variant or the gamma variant, its use is not recommended. And so many facilities, if they can get some of these others, um, like um, casarivimab and indemimab, are actually moving towards trying to have that just to preempt um, you know, uh, the medication not being effective. And so to the question that we uh, introduced in the pretest, it's important here to note that the EUA approval is for certain groups of outpatients. And the EUA approval, again, is for those three classes that I mentioned with the kind of you know, asterisk around the bemlanivimab cocktail. So it's approved for those who have mild to moderate uh, COVID or presenting in an outpatient setting who have risk factors for COVID complications. These individuals must be greater than 12 years old and they have to be early in their course. So they have to be within that 10 day span. And again, earlier is better. And so if you're seeing them, you're really pushing as much as you can to, if they have these risk factors and they meet these criterion to, to get them in and to get those infusions as quickly as possible. Patients have to be monitored. There are hypersensitivity reactions that, that have been seen to happen within the study setting. So patients have to be monitored and there has to be um, crash card and that kind of assistance is available. We included here, um, because of the reversal with them when they as a simple cocktail, we included here information sheets that you can go to and learn about the, the studies that were used for this, as well as um, the uh, adverse reactions that we're seeing. Um, and this is a good place to follow in general because if there are any updates, those will be made there. So mild to moderate, 12 and up, those who are high risk for COVID symptoms. And then, um, you know, again, just kind of, as kind of a reminder, taking a look at these, these categories, some that really stand out um, for me as a provider that I know that I will see a lot are, you know, just, just a review of the risk categories are individuals who are of older age, individuals who are obese or overweight, pregnant individuals, those with diabetes, chronic kidney disease, those who are immunocompromised, um, uh, those who have cardiovascular disease, those with chronic lung cancer, sickle cell disease, and a host below there. So for me, many of my patients would fit into this category, which is good to know because you know, again, if they're presenting with um, signs of mild to moderate COVID, you have some tools uh, in your toolkit to use for them. Um, and it's just noted here that the, the FDA EUA was expanded to list these conditions. And so it's worth, again, checking to see what is um, covered. So because of the changes that were mentioned and finding um, that some of the medications were more or some of the cocktails are more um, effective than others, what has happened um, is that we have slightly different recommendations, but that are kind of pointing us towards um, a, a set of, of, of two primary treatments that we should use. Um, in July of this year, the NIH recommended the use of casarivimab and endevimab or, or uh, sotrovimab in outpatients at high risk. IDSA had previously recommended the bemlanivimab cocktail, and now they're also saying um, a same, the, the same thing. There's also a note here about um, really being mindful of the variant susceptibility as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we want to make a note about a, um, a new, a new uh, data that's coming out from the recovery study. And this was a study of the casariv of casarivimab and endevimab. And what I read to you from before was all studies that were done outpatient. So individuals who are coming with mild to moderate, this is a different setting to see how effective um, antibodies are within those who are, who are hospitalized who are by definition more severe. The study looked at 9,785 hospitalized patients, a uh, mean age of about 62 years old. And it was a label, open label, and it was standard of care or standard of care adding the casarivimab and endevimab cocktail. 94% of the individuals in the study were receiving steroids, and the median time from, um, from symptom onset was about nine days. So if you look at the 28% mortality, you can see that the casarivimab and endevimab um, cocktail slightly, for those who um, were seronegative, definitely had some reduction in 28-day mortality, but for those who kind of all comers, that, that, that reduction was slightly attenuated. And so um, those results are still being kind of parsed out um, to make sure that the benefit is something that would be beneficial enough to think about that population-wide spread if this were to be approved. 
And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague to tell you more about how we're treating hospitalized patients. Thank you so much. That's such a great review to always kind of just, I pick something up every time um, about how, you know, the outpatient doctors are keep, keep, keeping up on all that literature. You know, I feel like COVID-19 has just like every day there's something new every week. There's something new. So you have to make sure you keep up on the literature to make sure you're providing your patients with the best um the best treatment options that we have and that science can give us. Um, you know, as a pulmonary critical care uh, attending, you know, the majority of my time is spent in the ICU, at least during COVID. Um, and so I'm going to kind of be going through like what I saw on the inpatient side. You know, it was, it was really, really sad to see, actually. You know, I'm glad that the numbers got significantly better and that, you know, we are not where we were, obviously, in December. January, February, March, um, but you know I do get some level of anxiety every time I see the new cases start to rise. So, um, just to give you a little bit of information as far as like what kind of treatment options we had on the inpatient side, I'll start with some of the uh, one of the antivirals that uh, we started to use early on during the pandemic. So we're going to discuss remdesivir. It's basically a pro drug that diffuses in the cell wall where it undergoes uh, several conversions to ultimately interfere with the viral re replication. And this is just kind of a uh, an illustration of how it does that. Um, you know, what the data uh, that supported the use of remdesivir was via the ACT-1 trial. Um, it was one of the early trials that kind of gave us a hint of maybe some more, what we saw was um, maybe shortening some of the hospital stays, which is actually very important for us on the inpatient side, just because the more patients we had on the inpatient side, the more overwhelming and the shorter of resources we had. So when you look at the ACT-1 trial, it was a randomized controlled trial, uh, about a thousand patients uh, where they were randomized into remdesivir versus a placebo. Uh, and the median time since onset of symptoms was noted to be about nine days, and it ranged somewhere between six to 12. The primary outcome that this um, ACT-1 trial was looking at was time to recovery, and the median time to recovery was 10 days in the remdesivir group versus 15 days in the placebo group, therefore shortening your hospital uh, time to recovery by five days. Um, and that was uh, statistically significant. There was a mortality. There was mortality trends in the in the trial where it looked like at 15 days there was some statistical significant difference between the two groups. But at day 29, that difference was no longer there. So although the trends were there, we kind of lost it um, at day 29. So maybe we can, this is a diagram uh, illustration of the difference between the remdesivir and the placebo group when it came to the proportion of recovery. But if we look, if we look at this, a subgroup analysis of the estimates of, estimates of recovery within the different groups, um, you can see that, um, as I highlighted here, the patients receiving oxygen actually had the most benefit. If you, with patients not receiving oxygen, there was benefit, but the benefit wasn't as vast. And that benefit was lost after patients were receiving high flow oxygen or non-invasive mechanical ventilation or ended up on mechanical ventilation uh, or ECMO. So again, I highlight that the, pen, the patients who benefited the most were the patients receiving oxygen via nasal cannula had the most benefit. Uh, so you also, you know, we know that there's benefit there with regards to recovery time. So, you know, you always look at trials and, and make sure that there's no adverse events that occur with the intervention that you're giving. So regarding recovery time, we saw that benefit. Um, again, I highlight only in the nasal cannula group. But what are some of the adverse events? So serious adverse events uh, were seen in the treatment group of uh, at 24.6% versus 31.6%. And that um, change in serious adverse events, as you can see in the grade three or four, um, the fact that patients were less likely to end up on mechanical ventilation is the one that I will highlight. So with that data, the NIH and IDSA guidelines, they, um, as of uh, December, NIH recommended that 
if anyone that was hospitalized and requires supplemental oxygen, but not through invasive mechanical ventilation or ACMO, that they be started on remdesivir. And on the IDSA side, patients who were hospitalized with severe COVID-19, meaning that they were hypoxic on room air, satting less than 94%, and require supplemental oxygen, but again, not requiring mechanical ventilation or ACMO, we should initiate therapy with remdesivir. So we, I gave you uh, the antiviral. Now let's look on, into the immunomodulators. So this was basically a landmark trial for us. We, um, at the time of the publication of this trial, was the only thing we had to hold on to um, that actually showed some mortality benefits. So. Like I mentioned, landmark trial uh, published in 2020. It was a UK trial uh, by the recovery group and using glucocorticoids or dexamethasone for its anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Um, and the trial was stopped actually early because there was sufficient evidence of benefit. It was a trial that had a two to one ratio enrollment into the control versus dexamethasone. and. As you can see here by the graphical illustration, there was overall improvement um, in all comers with dexamethasone from 25.7 to 22.9, but the patients who benefited the most were the patients who were requiring mechanical ventilation. As you can see, it was from 41% to 29%. Um, and so that gave us gave us a lot of hope. You know, a lot of our patients who were ending up on the mechan on mechanical ventilation were not doing well and were not surviving. Um, but the patients on oxygen, although they had a benefit, that benefit was not as vast. And then the people who actually looked like they were not um, not only benefited but might be harmful had a trend to worse outcomes with pa were patients who were not on oxygen. Uh, this is a, a steroid meta-analysis that was published in JAMA um, as a follow-up. It had seven randomized controlled trials using three uh, steroid types across trials. But as you can see, of course, there was the number of deaths that was favorable on the steroid side, but um, a lot of these crossed one. And if you look at the overall uh, random effects, it is it is showing that there was uh, it was favorable for the steroid group, but predominantly because of the recovery trial. So let's let's move on to the IL six inhibitors as other forms of immunomodulation. Uh, this is the remap cat pragmatic trial. It was a randomized control trial that used two different types of IL six inhibitors, although predominantly the tocilizumab. Uh, was uh, used more often than the, than the sirolimab <laughs> uh, versus the control. Um, patients that were enrolled were people who were uh, requiring high flow, high flow nasal cannula, but less than one day in ICU care. So we tried to get them a little bit on the earlier, sen earlier end as they were getting sicker. Uh, because we were noting that a lot of the inflammatory markers were basically skyrocketing when they ended up in our ICUs. 88% um, of those patients were receiving dexamethasone on top. It became the standard of care really early on um, because of the pre, uh, recovery trial. And the primary endpoint for this um, IL-6 uh, trial was combined mortality days free of organ support. And the tocilizumab had 10-day improvement in organ uh, support-free days compared to placebo. And the cyrulimab had 11-day improvement, although not the predominant, obviously, among the two groups. And the mortality, uh, the difference was 28% uh, reduction versus 35 with uh, TOSI and 22% versus 35 with cyrulimab. So there was a follow-up trial, the tocilizumab trial arm, which basically looked at just tocilizumab versus usual care. It was a UK trial. 80% of the patients were on steroids. Uh, 40 per, about 40% were on non-invasive uh, mechanical ventilation, and 45% had no respiratory support. The enrollment, um, as far as like the number of average of days that patient had symptoms, were nine to 10 days. And they had to have um, saturations on room air less than 92% or require oxygen support and CRPs to be elevated um, at above or equal to 75. So really inflamed on the sicker end, 
Um, they received a single dose of IV uh, tocilizumab, although the clinician did have the option to provide a second dose if they felt like it was indicated. Outcomes, 20-day uh, mortality, as you can see, there was a reduction of 15%. Uh, there was a 28-day uh, discharge increase, 22%, uh, and then progression to invasive mechanical ventilation decreased by 21%. Median days to discharge was, uh, for usual care, more than 28 days, and then for TOSI was 19 days. Uh, but if you look at, okay, like timing of medication, we talked about that in the very beginning of the talk, is that patients who benefited the most were patients who were given the medication at less than seven days or at seven days of onset of symptoms. So that was key. And then if you look at the respiratory support at randomization, it looks like the people who were much sicker were getting the medication uh, compared to the other two, although all of them crossed one. And then most of the patients who benefited from the tocilizumab were the people who were also receiving the standard of care, which was corticosteroids. So now uh, the most latest, I think, that we have is the JAK2 and uh, the JAK inhibitors. So baricitinib, um, which I think the first trial was the ACT2 trial, and it did improve time to recovery when um, given with remdesivir in patients who require supplemental oxygen, but this trial did not evaluate the effects of baricitinib with steroids. So there was a follow-up that did account for that. The COVID barrier trial was about 1,500 patients which were receiving standard of care, the majority of that being cortical steroids, 80% and then 20% of remdesivir. The primary endpoint was death or progression to high flow um, non-invasive ventilation requiring a vent or ECMO, and there was no significant difference. But the secondary endpoint, uh, the all-cause mortality, had a 38% risk reduction. And the greatest improvement in mortality were those on high-flow oxygen or non-invasive uh, ventilation. So based on that literature, uh, the NIH and the IDSA guidelines for the usage of uh, baricitinib and TOSI is that in uh, for the NIH in hospitalized patients, they do recommend either TOSI or baricitinib in combination with dexamethasone alone or with remdesivir for patients on high flow or non-invasive mechanical ventilation with evidence of progression or increased markers of inflammation. So people who are starting to get sicker and the up in the ICU require much uh, higher levels of high flow or non-invasive with uh, inflammatory markers that are high, skyrocketing. When cortical steroids cannot be used, then they recommend baricitinib with remdesivir in non-intubated patients who require supplemental oxygen. As far as on the IDSA guide, uh, side um, in hospitalized patients with severe critical uh, COVID-19 on high flow or non-invasive ventilation and markers that are also high. So basically same thing, suggest that using TOSI or baricitinib in addition to the standard of care should be our, uh, should be our choices. So this is kind of just a summary of the NIH recommendations. If you look on the left side, it has disease severity, um, and then on the right side, a panel's uh, recommendations. So if you're hospitalized but not uh, requiring supplemental oxygen, there's insufficient data for or against the routine use of remdesivir and patients at high risk of disease progression, remdesivir may be appropriate. In patients that are hospitalized but requiring supplemental oxygen, basically via nasal cannula, then it is indicated to provide remdesivir for patients requiring minimal oxygen amounts. And dexamethasone plus remdesivir, if patients look like they're going in the wrong direction, essentially that their uh, oxygen demands are increasing, and then dexamethasone, when combination with remdesivir, shouldn't be used if only um, patients are requiring just nasal cannula. So hospitalized and requiring oxygen via high flow or non-invasive ventilation, those are the patients you definitely want to do dexamethasone. There are recommendations of doing dexamethasone plus remdesivir. And then recently, uh, like the most recent um, papers that I just mentioned, showing that hospitalized patients with rapidly increasing oxygen and high inflammatory markers uh, should tocilizumab plus one of the above should be added.
And the hospitalized patients requiring invasive mechanical ventilation or ACMA, dexamethasone, uh, patients within 24 hours of ICU admission, it would be dex plus um, tocilizumab. You know, so we have all these outpatient um, therapies that uh, Dr. Safo just reviewed with us. And then I talked to you guys about the inpatient therapies, you know, but despite all our treatment um, options that we have on the outpatient and inpatient side, we feel that, you know, disparities still persist. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, we see this um, in all of our, in both of our practices on a daily basis. Um, regarding how uh, Black and Latinx communities are disproportionately affected. That's exactly right. And I think one of the things that's important about our conversation here is to think about what is behind and driving those higher rates of infection, higher rates of hospitalization, and higher mortality rates. Um, early on in the pandemic, there were some articles that talked about biologic uh, biological reasons for that, that there were certain um, receptors that were expressed in these populations that may have been explaining it. That was debunked. And there is, you know, the understanding now, and I think we're all having the common and shared language now around the ways in which the environments that we find ourselves in and the systemic inequities um, that these groups often experience are actually the drivers of their higher rates of infection. And so I really appreciate Dr. Chichia, you know, kind of leading us into this discussion with saying that, yes, we have all of these treatments and still we need to be thinking about how we're addressing the needs of these particular groups. Um, the data does support that these groups are, are, are experiencing um, everything around COVID in much more severe ways. We wanted to share with you, I'll talk through the New York study and Dr. Chichio will talk through the, um, the Milwaukee study because when you go deep into two very different environments and yet are finding uh, similar outcomes, I think it really shows that these, these realities are consistent pretty much across the US. In New York at an academic, academic medical center, we took a look at um, outcomes around race from March to April. So this was very early on. And that's important to keep in mind because, again, further studies have kind of reinforced these early findings. What we found among 9,000 patients who had um, at least two co comorbidities or more, um, many of them were, they were um, about 40% Black, 34% Hispanic, uh, and whites comprised about 28% and the remainder were other, is that you saw Black and Hispanic patients um, with uh, higher test positivity, higher hospitalizations, and that, that's the graphic to the right. And that then um, analysis was done to evaluate mortality and survival. And initially, um, when the unadjusted results were evaluated, uh, the mortality among Black and Hispanic patients was actually slightly lower. Once they accounted for the following factors, and this is important, age, sex, socioeconomic status, comorbidities, once that was adjusted for, you saw um, that the impact um, really rose to the top, that Hispanic um, Americans had a hazard ratio um, of survival that was 0.77, so less chance of survival, and that number was pretty close to what uh, Blacks were experiencing as it, as it related to COVID outcomes. And so once you kind of strip down to race as a driving factor, you see that that holds um, and confers a mortality difference. Yeah, it's so interesting to see that. Um... Because, you know, we, I mean, I saw it on the inpatient side. The majority of my patients were Hispanic. You know, I, I practice in the city of Orange, and, you know, we have a lot of surrounding low socioeconomic Latinx communities. And that, I mean, in over 80 to 90% of my patients were Latinos. Um, so as I, as she alluded, you know, I was going to discuss the Milwaukee Academic Center study, which was published in uh, March of 2020, you know, a large academic center during the early phase of the pandemic. Keep in mind, Milwaukee County does compose of about 27% uh, of African Americans. Um, so 2,500 patients were included in this analysis. And being African American put you at a higher rate to test positive for COVID-19. The proportion of three or more comorbidities was higher in African Americans compared to non-African Americans. Poverty status was higher in Blacks as well. Being COVID positive was associated with being 
African-American male sex and age of 60 or greater. I mean, the study shows that even after adjusting for zip code, black patients and living in poverty increase your chances of being hospitalized. I mean, although poverty was not associated with ICU admissions, uh, neither race nor poverty was associated with death or the need uh, for mechanical ventilation in this study, but it does highlight, you know, you're more likely to be admitted to the hospital, you're more likely to test positive as well. And I think what's so interesting about, about these studies is that they're reflecting what we've known for some time. And I feel like Dr. Chinchia, you, you are as aware that, you know, as I am, as your zip code does determine so much of your health outcomes. This graphic that we included because it's just kind of a nice representation. If you look across just 14 miles in New Jersey, the life expectancy in Princeton um, goes from 87 years old down to 73 years old. And this is just, just looking at zip code and taking the average life expectancy by census data. And so um, what's really interesting about this is that it starts to it starts to force us to have the conversation around what are the factors that are impacting these areas that are leading, you know, leading us to see these differences. If this is what the life expectancy is, and this is kind of you know, pre-COVID, this is just what it is, you can imagine that if you then lay over an infectious disease, one that's spread um, you know, through respiratory, um, through, you know, one, one that's airborne and, and spread pretty easily, you're going to see that these numbers will be impacted, certainly differentially, for an area where the life expectancy difference is already so stark. Absolutely. And, you know, as you led me into that, so what are the determinants of health? I mean, if you look at this graph, it says 40% is behavioral, 30% uh, is genetic predisposition, about 15% social circumstances, 10% health care, and about 5% environmental exposure. Uh, but so uh, one thing that I want to highlight is that when you look at behavioral patterns, um, it's the predominant factor in the determinant of health. But with regards to behavioral things, obesity and inactivity being one of the predominating factors is, you know, uh, affected by a lot of like what this patient population faces. Like who, most of the people who um, are, come from low socioeconomic backgrounds obviously live in neighborhoods in which their access to a, a, like a safe park, you know, can they really go um, and, and after they come home from work to go exercise because they don't feel safe or one, they don't have enough parks around their areas. Uh, two, like the access to healthier foods, um, you know, healthier foods are more expensive. Uh, it's much, much cheaper to get hot dogs and a bunch of bread than to buy like fresh, um, fresh fruits and vegetables. It, it, it's the reality of it. And so it's not only just these behavioral things, but everything that surrounds the, the behavioral uh, options that these patients have. Uh, experience demonstrates it's possible to, it's possible to change behavior uh, with increased education, with increased access to healthier foods, with areas to safely partake in exercise, with access to health care. So, I mean, all of these things are affected by, these patients are affected not only um, by genetic and all the other things we mentioned, but a big portion of it is what, what, what uh, all the, the disparities that exist for them. And so this kind of just highlights what I, most of what I, some of the things that I just described, economic stability, have an employment, have an income, being able to, you know, support their family, uh, neighborhood and physical environment. I talked about parks. Uh, you know, some patients don't come to my clinic because they don't have somebody to drive them there. They don't have money for transportation. Um, education is a big component as well. Uh, literacy, language barriers, um, most, most of them don't have higher education. I mentioned food as a hunger, access to healthy options, community and social contacts, you know, social in uh, integration, support systems, community engagement, discrimination, stress, such a big thing nowadays, you know, that it's, um, that, that really affects, um, outcomes for patients and then healthcare systems, you know. Having being underinsured, uh, not having insurance, 
Um, so those are all things that are going to affect this population. And like uh, Dr. Seifo, I just men mentioned, you know, uh, you add like a virus that basically just highlights all these disparities. Yeah, and you know, I had a patient, I had a couple of patients say this to me, but one patient in particular stood out when um, they called and said that they had been, you know, they had an exposure in their home and, you know, this patient had HIV. And so we went through the whole importance of quarantining and, you know, being isolated. And they just basically said, like, then if that's the case, I know I'm going to get this. And it was like, you know, well, well why? And they're like, I, I don't have anywhere else to go. And we're all in this small apartment together. Um, and that feeling of, you know, um, there's just the reality of our lived experience that, you know, I can't avoid is something that I think we really experience. And this patient actually said to me um, that they had seen one of the reporters on CNN. I think it was um, Cuomo, Chris Cuomo, Cuomo, who went down into his basement to quarantine and how, like, how, how you know, they, they just brought it up because it was so different than their experience of being in a small New York City apartment and having nowhere to go and knowing, even with their chronic illness, that they were going to get sick. And so I think exactly to what we've been mentioning here around these social determinants of health, COVID is really highlighted yet again. Um, in a paper from um, the AMA um, task force talked about how rather than validating long, de long debunked hypotheses about intrinsic biological susceptibilities among non-white racial groups, the evidence to date reaffirms that structural racism is a critical driving force behind COVID-19 disparities. And I take that along with this quote, um, which is that uh, COVID is a funhouse mirror that's amplifying issues that have existed forever. People are not dying of COVID, they're dying of racism, of economic inequality, and it's not going to stop with COVID. Any reactions to that, Dr. Jinkia? Uh, you know, it hits home because, I mean, we, we see it in, in the literature, but when it hits... Um, when it hits you hard and, and the number of patients you're seeing are from low socioeconomic backgrounds and are dying, it, it really is, 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 it's really difficult. Yeah, yeah. And it's why these conversations are important because it's worth us not just asking what monoclonal antibody therapy can I give you, but also what's your environment and how do we intercede on that to make sure that you're kept safe. So in summary, we've discussed quite a number of things. We wanted to make sure you guys had um, the main takeaways, and then we'll actually hear from a patient um, because that voice is always really important. Um, so in summary, being Black, American, um, American Indian, Alaska Native, or Latinx is associated with a higher risk of COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and death. And there are unequal health risks, um, and these are a result of what we talked about, um, where people live, how they learn, where they gather, their age, you know, really the social determinants of health. Monoclonal antibody treatments are available for outpatients, and these are outpatients at high risk of progressing to severe disease or hospitalization, patients over the age of 12. Antiviral treatments with remdesivir is FDA approved for all hospitalized patients. Recommendations for this use vary, but it's typically most effective in patients who are receiving oxygen, but who are not on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Antiviral and antibody-based therapies work best if they're administered as early as possible. And the magic dexamethasone has lowered mortality rates in patients with severe um, critical COVID-19. So I want to just turn your attention to um, a patient who had COVID. And, you know, she tells her story better, better than I think any of us could. And just for the producer, really if you can help me press play on this. I really was feeling bad and I knew something was wrong. So when I did wake up that Friday morning, I drove myself to the ER. The doctor came and she said, we can send you home on some oral antibiotics. I said, if I stay here, will I get the antibiotics I beat? And she said, yes. And I said, I think I wanna stay. But I did that because I was scared. The nurse that was taking care of me that day, I requested to her that she um, contact the doctor because I had been on every antibiotic and my temperature was still 104. And he said, we're going to test you for a respiratory panel. We're going to test you for HIV. And we're going to test you for the coronavirus. I just hear someone screaming in the hallway, 
And I told my girlfriend, I said, that's my mom. So my girlfriend gets up to see, was that really my mom? And when she got up and went out the door, a security guard came and slammed the door closed. And I'm banging on the window, banging on the window, trying to know what's going on. Security guard kept his back to the door the whole time. I turned the wheelchair around and I looked up at the television. We are told, in fact, that there is a person who is being treated in New Orleans that is from Jefferson Parish right this now. This is a person who has contracted the coronavirus. They are from Jefferson Parish. But again, they are at the VA hospital in New Orleans getting treatment right now. Who do you think that was? Wow, thank you very much for um, giving Kim's story a platform. And thank you to Dr. Safo and Dr. Chinchia for all that very important information we received today. So um, I will hand this um, question over to Dr. Chinchia before we go over to our next post-test question. Uh, what is the optimal timing to initiate remdesivir treatment? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, hospitalized patients requiring um, oxygen or that they have um, their saturation at less than 94% of room air. So essentially when they're hospitalized and require oxygen. Great, thank you. And um, I'll take this opportunity, Dr. Sefa, to ask you a question. For people who have recovered sure. from COVID, are two doses of vaccine still recommended for the mRNA vaccines? Absolutely, and those people are actually the kind of lucky folks among us because if you get if you've had COVID and you get both um, and you get vaccinated, what we are finding, what studies have shown, is that what one study showed is that you're you may actually be um, set up for lifelong immunity because um, the way that the vaccination, in addition to your passive immunity, kind of acts is to confer immunity that, that seems to be um, only strengthening over time versus what we're concerned about with people who haven't had COVID and have gotten vaccinated that they may need a booster shot. So the data on that are still you know, um, kind of coming out, but if you have had COVID, getting a COVID vaccine is so important for you because it will confer the kind of immunity that'll keep you clear for, for at least many years, if not for hopefully for a lifetime. Wow, very good and encouraging news there. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I'm going to toss this question up um, to our faculty. Are the current antibody treatments expected to be effective against the emerging strains? And what about convalescent plasma? I'm, I'm happy to I take that. Um, oh, no, please, Dr. Chinchia, please. No, 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 please. You do, please. Go ahead. <laughs> So um, as you saw from the slide that where we showed those three cocktails, um, there, the emergent strains, the emergent variants are showing us that um, we have to test. So every time that there is a new strain, we will have to take it and evaluate it against the current cocktail. It's hard to tell. Convalescent plasma at this point, and Dr. Jinchia, you can speak to this more, does not seem to be holding up um, against some of the newest strains that are coming out. But I would say this is an important question that is worth looking at the data as they come out for each of the um, antibody cocktails and for each of the strains, excuse me, each of the variants. I was just going to comment on the convalescent plasma portion of it. Um, I know it wasn't included in, in the talk, but there is basically the recommendations from the, from the NIH and IDSA. It's basically there's insufficient evidence to recommend either for it or against it. There's been a lot of observational data, case reports, case series. There's some retrospective case control studies that suggest some benefit in people that have high titers of uh, once you uh, transfuse high titers, but that benefit isn't the same for low titers. So that's, that's what we're not um, doing the convalescent plasma anymore, at least at our center. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, to our faculty um, for this really valuable information and to our audience, if you would like to claim credit, please click the claim credit button that will appear when the webcast ends. Um, be on the lookout for your 30 day survey. You'll get that through email. Um, as always, your responses will help us develop further education. We thank you for joining us and have a great day. Dr. Chinchia, Dr. Safa, thank you so much. Thank you. Get vaccinated. <laughs>